Right. Let's just uh, commit our time to the Lord in prayer before we can get into the scriptures. Lord, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to open up thy word this morning. For the freedom we enjoy in this land as we've been reminded this morning. And Lord, once again for thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave everything for us when he died upon that cross of Calvary. Lord, thou knowest that I've uh, been nervous about this message. But pray for thy peace. Pray, Lord, for thy leading. And just pray that, Lord, your hand of blessing be upon each and every one of us. As you ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Can we turn in our Bibles, please, to Jonah? And we're going to start off in chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, and we're going to read through to the end of chapter 2. So Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17. And we're going to read through to the end of chapter 2. If you're trying to work out where Jonah is, don't worry, because it is a tricky one to find. It's a little bit left of the New Testament, say a little bit. If you go past Obadiah, you've gone too far. Um, just before Micah. Okay, so Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. We're going to read until the end of chapter 2. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the th fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And said... I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. <coughs> when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that thou that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I just trust the Lord will bless his word this morning. Right. This is not going to be necessarily the most popular message. And as I preach this morning, I want you to know one thing. I love each and every one of you. So please, no stones, no booing, no casting me forth. Um, what I preach this morning is the view I have come to from the scriptures. It does not necessarily mean I am right. It is just the view and the conclusion I have reached based on the scriptures. And with that, let's start. So we've got two perspectives. Jonah has been swallowed by a fish. A fish that was prepared uh, by God to swallow him. Two possibilities straight away. One, this specially prepared fish was much, much bigger than any other fish you have ever seen. Why do I say that? Because humanly speaking, it is actually impossible to survive in a whale's belly or in a fish's belly. And the reason I say a whale is because obviously in Matthew 12 verse 40, and you will know for the record, there will be a lot of moving between scriptures this morning. But in Matthew 12 verse 40, a parallel verse, we read for us, Jonas, which is Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So it's a whale, but... Physically speaking, I looked into this, well researched, okay, physically speaking, it's actually humanly impossible to survive inside the whale, the belly of a whale, for three days and three nights. It is not physically possible. So, two possibilities. One, God had prepared uh, an exception to the rule. This, this fish was bigger than any other fish you have ever seen. Okay, that's your first possibility. The second possibility, he must have died. 
That's your second possibility. Um, and that's personally the view I come to reading this passage. That Jonah probably did not live in the whale's belly. Because there's no there's a lack of oxygen. You've got the crushing effect of plates. You've got noxious gases. Lots and lots of reasons for that. And I'm not going to go into it. It's, it's entirely up to you. But bear in mind there are lots of miraculous things in scripture. Things we have to accept. And this is the view I've come to. So my view is that he must have died. Now, why is that key? Because in verse 2 it says, And said I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So the question is this. What does hell mean here? There are two possibilities, um, two lines that people tend to go down. The first line, the translation being Sheol, just means death. The second line being, it literally means a place of suffering, because Sheol, as we know, can be translated as grave. I've gone blank. Grave, got it written down here. That's, that's a relief. Hell and the pit, okay? So Sheol could be translated in different ways in different places in his scripture. So the question is this. In this passage, is it a place of suffering or is it just simply death? Now the thing is, here, if it's death, you have to accept that Jonah died. But then if he died, the soul is immortal. Where did his soul go? It would have to have gone somewhere. Where would it have gone? So, this is what I'm going to preach on this morning, why I think Jonah went to hell, and as an extension of that, and this is why, and I'm not going to fall out with anyone if they disagree with me on this, because there are doctrines in the Bible that are fundamental, and I've had conversations with you about this over the years, fundamental doctrines, you're saved by grace through faith, not of works. That's a fundamental doctrine, the fact that we're saved by the blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. A fundamental doctrine. If you don't necessarily agree with me on this, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. doesn't mean I'm a Christian, not a Christian for believing this. It's just a difference of opinion. And we're all going to have those differences. And as I've said before, this is the conclusion I've reached based on my own study. Um... So, why I think Jonah went to hell as an extension of that, why I believe the Lord Jesus Christ when he died on the cross of Calvary, why I personally believe from scripture that he also went to hell and suffered there before he rose again. So, the first reason, Matthew 12 verse 40, for as Jonas, oh by the way there's about 20 of these, so it's going to be a while, so if you do start to get bored feel free to just switch off at any point and you can listen to it again because there's evidence of it which is brilliant right first one matthew 12 verse 40 for as jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth it says here that christ was in the heart of the earth well, that's interesting because a sepulcher wasn't actually underground it was on top of the ground that's the first thing the sepulchre that they placed his body in was not in the heart of the earth. It was actually on the top of the earth. It was a sepulchre. Um, and Jonas was in the whale's belly, but he went down to the bottom of the mountains, it says, here. Now again, if it was a, technically, if you take the line of view that this was a specially prepared whale, perhaps it could have swam to a depth much, much lower than typical. But the depths of the mountains, they can go down incredibly deeply. Much further than it would be possible to survive in terms of the pressure. Again, but as we say, miracles can happen. But if we accept that Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth, therefore, by extension, it's not hugely unbelievable to believe that Jonah was also there. Similarly, we've got, as a second point here, the similarity between the hell described in Luke 16, which is the rich man and Lazarus, and the place where Jonah prayed from. Um, both, in fact, it would be good at this point, I think, to turn just to Luke 16, because it's going to be quite a parallel passage here, picking up, and keep your finger in Jonah, picking up on some of the similarities between the place where uh, Jonah prayed from 
and the place where the rich man was as well. So, and I'm going to read from verse 19, because this is really key, I think, really, so I want to go through the whole thing. Verse 19 of Luke 16. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth a Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. And thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you there is a great goal fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So what are the similarities between this place where Jonah prayed from and the place where the rich man is in Luke chapter 16? The first is this, they're both a place of torment. It says in Jonah chapter 2 that he was afflicted. Affliction. Very much a word that's synonymous with torment. A word that's used in Luke 16. They're both a place of memory. Jonah talks about how he remembered um, the Lord. And remembered praying to the tem- to, uh, toward the Holy Temple. Uh, whereas in Luke chapter 16 we read how the rich man remembered his relatives upon the earth. And even um, Abraham reminds him and says, remember in your lifetime the good things that you received. They're both a place of remorse. This rich man here is clearly very sad. He wants to go back. He wants to warn his family. He's sorry. And here in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah Jonah chapter 2, sorry, I'm looking at the top there. um, We can see he's remorseful, okay, for what's gone on. Um, The fact that they both cried out those words and finally the fact that they both were able to pray remember that god is everywhere passage that colin our brother read from this morning psalm 139 mentions that even on the tops of the air uh, even at the highest point he is there even in the lowest depths he is there they both prayed now that's interesting the fact that we've got those similarities between this place where the rich man is in luke 16 And this place where Jonah is in Jonah chapter 2. So my third reason, the fact that both Jonah and Christ are mentioned in reference to hell. And this is important because Jonah is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the sense of um, his rebellion, because we know that Jesus Christ was perfect. There was no sin found in him, no guile. Um, He was perfect. So in Psalm 16 verse 10 we read these words. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is mentioned again in reference to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2 verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. There are two lines of reason. One Here hell refers to death and the grave. The second line is that it's a literal place of suffering. And as we go through this, we'll hopefully try to pick this apart a little more as well. But what we do need to do is we do need to deal with it. We need to address it. We need to understand what is this place. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. It's soul. It's not body. Now if it was the body, that's death. 
It mentions here the soul. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Well, the soul has to be somewhere. The body can be in the ground, the body can become worm food, but the soul is immortal, it's everlasting. It goes somewhere at death, the spirit goes back to God. But the soul has to be somewhere. And that's something we're going to look at in more depth as we go through. So, let's go on to the next point. Oh yeah, the next point was the soul is immortal. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, which is a good verse to look at because it talks about the tripart uh, person. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly they're not the same. The body is not the same as the soul is not the same as the spirit. In the same way, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all one, but they're all separate as well. We are made up of body, soul, and spirit. In Luke chapter 12, verse 20, and this is key as well, But God said unto him, Thou fall this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Thy soul shall be required of thee. If it was the body... Well, that's different again. The body dies. But this is the soul. Where is the soul going to go? The description of where Jonah is does not sound like the inside of a whale's belly. This is key again. Because what we read about here is we read about being at the bottoms of the mountains. The bars, to my knowledge, there are no bars necessarily at the very bottom depths of the earth. Mary will probably correct me because she's doing her science and everything, but um, to my knowledge, nobody's ever been able to go down to that level of depth and build bars. So he's either speaking metaphorically, spiritually, or he's speaking literally. And this is always one of those tricky bits. How do you distinguish between the three? By looking at different portions of scripture. Okay? Uh, it talks about the weeds wrapped about my head. Now, yeah, maybe. Being in a whale's belly, you'd get weeds wrapped around your head. But then you've got to deal with the being brought down to the bottoms of the mountains. The bars. Similarly, it mentions of Christ that he descended to the lower part of the earth in Ephesians 4. Okay, which I'm going to turn to now. Ephesians 4. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of um, shifting through the scriptures this morning. And as I say, this is just the view I've come to based on scripture. It does not necessarily mean I am right. Um, my Bible, the first Bible I was ever given, was from a brother at Hope Chapel. And I was 14 at the time. And I had, um, in some ways, it was quite interesting to open up that Bible again. It was a um, one of those Bibles where you've got a blank page on every alternate page. And I looked back through my notes and thought, my Life. Did I really think that? Granted, I was 14 at the time, and Colin will testify because he knew me when I was a lot younger. I was about 18 when I had driving lessons with him. I was not necessarily the sharpest block, you know. So, yes, people change and their views change as they grow up. And this may not necessarily be what I think in 10 years' time, but at this point in time, based on Scripture, this is what I believe. Um, so... Ephesians 4, verses, and we're going to go from verse, Ephesians 4, oh yeah, it helps from looking at, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same, also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. He says he descended, but his body was in a grave. We know that his soul, which is immortal, had to be somewhere, and it says he descended. Now this is interesting because in Luke chapter 16 we read about Abraham's bosom. We also know, and we're going to touch on this, that he said to the man on the cross, the thief on the cross, he said, Today sh thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we know that very day he was in paradise. However, 
we also know there's a gulf between that place of hell and that place called paradise or Abraham's bosom in Luke chapter 16. But here again, I just want to point out to you the fact that he descended first suggests that whilst the cross was key, it was essential, it was perfect. Was it finished there? We'll look at as we move further forward. Death and hell are not the same. They are separate. That would have actually been a really good thing to have pointed out earlier. Uh, but I will give you a quick verse. Matthew 5 verse 29 is a great one. Because it says, And if thine right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable uh, for thee that one of thy members perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. We all die. What on earth would the point be of plucking out an eye to avoid death? You die anyway. There would be a point in plucking out an eye if it were to avoid hell. So it's just logic there, really. Um, also, lots of descriptions. You read about fire in relation to hell. You read about suffering in relation to hell. You read about torment in relation to hell. You read about all these things. There's a clear difference between death and hell. Also, Revelation 1 verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Hell and death. They're separated in that passage. Can they be one and the same? It wouldn't make sense, would it? Even if you were to look at the Greek, I have the keys of Gehenna and Gehenna. It wouldn't make any logical sense to use the same word for two different things. This suggests that these two things are separate. Now, Jonah was a sinner. And the important thing to remember is that Christ took upon himself our sins. How was Jonah a sinner? Well, we talked about it in chapter 1. How he deliberately went the opposite direction to where he should have been going. Clear rebellion to God's word. He was a sinner. And we also know what the Bible says. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, this is key. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ was made sin for us. He took our sin upon himself. But this is key. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abide upon him. The wrath of God is on sinners, not saved by Christ. However, Christ was Christ. He took our sin upon himself. The thing here is this. If you die in your sins, where do you go? Where do you go if you die in your sins? Well, the answer to that is... And I had to, you know, I actually had to really think about this, because as I was preparing this, I got to a point where I started going really sort of... getting tunnel vision and thinking, I've got no idea what's going on now. Revelation 20, verse 15... And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who has their name written in the Lamb's book of life? Those saved by grace. Those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those people have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, those who don't have their name written in the Lamb's book of life, those who have sinned and never, never had it removed, those people are destined to hell. It says here, as we move on, was cast into the lake of fire. And death and hell were cast into the lake of hell, fire. Um, so here, we see that sinners, that's where they go. Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself. He took our sin upon himself. This is the thing. The fact that he died is a marvellous, marvellous thing. The fact that he suffered for us is incredible. But if it went further than that, if he even went to the very depths of hell for us, what effect does that have on us as believers? Does it make us love him less? No. Completely the contrary to that. It makes us love him more. That's my theory. If I think that not only did he die, he went one step further than that. 
He suffered in that place. That's even more incredible. That demands even more of our love. Even more of our adoration. It demands everything. Other script references in scripture suggested as well. Okay. Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the daughter of the famous nations unto the nether parts of the earth, for them that go down into the pit. Going down into the pit. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speak upon this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. The deep. Down. It's not the sepulchre. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The key verse here in connection, um, who shall ascend into the deep? Who raised Christ from the dead? Who raised Christ from the dead? Now we know that God the Father did, because it tells us that in, and I'm just going to look at my references here, I'm not going to turn to him because of time, because we'll be here until the middle of next week. Uh, this is quite a big study. Um, it tells us in Galatians 1 verse 1, Romans 10 verse 4, Romans 6 verse 4, and Romans 4 verse 24, that God the Father raised up Jesus from the dead. But in Romans 8 verse 11, 1 Peter 3 verse 18, it tells us that the Holy Spirit raised him up from the dead. And then this particular verse, John chapter 2 verse 19 to 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in the building. Thou wilt rear it up in three days. But he spake of the temple of his body. Jesus Christ was able to raise himself, along with God the Father, along with the Holy Spirit. Latimer had this to say about Christ suffering in hell. I see no inconvenience to say that Christ suffered in, in hell. I singularly commend the exceeding great charity of Christ that for our sakes would suffer in hell for his soul. And other well-studied saints have believed it as well. And I know this is a really spurious argument to say, oh, such and such and such and such have believed this because you can do that with pretty much any topic. You really can. Um, if you look far enough, you'll find all sorts of weird and wonderful beliefs and ideas and concepts believed by man. But C.H. Spurgeon... Um, and his comments in the Treasury of David at Psalm 16 and verse 10, he writes, Many of the elder reformers held that our Lord in soul actually descended into hell, according to some of them to suffer there as our surety, and according to others to make a public triumph over death and hell. This idea was almost universally, and as we believe, most properly repudiated by the Puritans. Okay? Spurgeon then goes on to quote one Nicholas Byfield, commenting on six, Psalm 16 verse 10. Thus Christ in soul descend into hell, when as our surety has submitted himself to bear those hellish sorrows, or equivalent to them, which we were bound by our sins to suffer forever. His descension in, is his projection of himself into the sea of God's wrath, can see for our sins and his ingression into the most unspeakable straits and torments in his soul, which we should else have suffered forever in hell. Thus Christ descended into hell when he was alive, not when he was dead. This is the key as well. It, it is finished does not necessarily mean the work of salvation. Why? Because in John 17 verse 4, what did he say? I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. To say it is finished... What is finished exactly? It's not definitive. What is finished is work on the earth. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe. He says here in John 17 verse 4, I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He says it there. So when it says it is finished, what exactly is finished? When he ascended, when he saw Mary, what does he say? 
He says, do you remember after the resurrection that he appeared to Mary at the tomb? He said, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. After three days and three nights he had been into the glory. Many of today's preachers would have us believe that the Lord Jesus Christ went straight from the cross to the glory. The Lord Jesus Christ had not yet been to heaven when he met Mary that very Sunday morning. This is also consistent with other scriptures which say that he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In John, four, uh, in my 14th point is this, and yes, there's a lot of points. Jonah was brought up again from death as was Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 tells us that he died, was buried, and rose again. And at the end of the passage, Jonah chapter 2, in Jonah 2, verse 10, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah is back in the land of the living. 15 points. The hell, um, the Passover lamb. What did they do to it to kill it? They burnt it. What do we read about with fire? With hell, we read about the fire. And finally, Mark 15, was the ninth hour when he um, cries that God had forsaken him. Why was it the ninth hour? Because after six hours it says darkness descended upon the earth. At the sixth hour there was darkness. Why did he say after the seventh hour, oh God, why have you forsaken me? Because at the sixth hour, that's when the darkness started. But he doesn't say it at the sixth hour. He doesn't say it at the seventh hour. He doesn't say it at the eighth hour. He says it at the ninth hour just before he dies. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why not when the darkness started? A lot of what I've done tonight has just been going literally all over the place to try and point out to you that, yes, it may not be correct. Yes, I may not have got it right. Um, and I accept that. And the reason I accept that is I am not necessarily the best speaker. I'm not necessarily the best student of the Word of God. I get things wrong, as do other people. What I am trying to point out to you is, this is the view I have come to based on studying the Scriptures. If Jonah, as a type of Christ, died... His soul had to go somewhere. The alternative view. It was a miracle. He was preserved. But this is ultimately it. Where did the soul go? The soul had to go somewhere. I'm not going to fall out with anyone over this. I just hope. It was. If nothing else. Interesting. If nothing else. It gets you to open up your Bible. To study it. To look again. Because that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to encourage each other. To spend time in God's word. And if through this. You go away and you say. right, I'm going to look at the scriptures again. And you don't change your conclusion. That's fine. What you have done is you've, you've gone back into the word of God. And that's the best place for every believer this morning. To be in the word of God. To be constantly learning. To be constantly meditating on our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. This I know though. The Lord Jesus Christ has done everything for us. And if he went to hell. If he did. He did that for us. And if he went there for us. That demands even more of our love. That demands even more of our time. Not to say that it wouldn't demand more. We should be giving Christ our rule regardless. But I'm just saying. Christ loved us. And I hope this morning that that was in some way a blessing. Even though it was a bit rambling. A bit all over the place. Amen.